During the 1972 Olympic Games in Munich, nine Israeli athletes and coaches were held by members of the Palestinian terror group Black September. The hostage situation that developed gripped and horrified the world, and brought to light the Palestinian cause in a violent manner. In the end, all nine hostages, five Black September members and one West German police officer were dead, leaving the world wondering just how this had happened. In today's video, we will cover the events that led up to the hostage situation, how it developed into a massacre and the consequences for the wider world. In 1936, the Nazi regime hosted the Olympic Games. Adolf Hitler sought to prove Aryan superiority and propagize his party's racial supremacist policies. It was the first Olympic Games to be televised but saw a number of Jewish athletes boycotting the event in protest of the Nazi anti-Semitic policies, including seeking to ban Jewish athletes from even attending. In contrast to the 1936 Olympic Games, West Germany sought to show the world just how much had changed since the last time Germany held the Games. It was to be known as the Cheerful Games, with an emphasis on a radiant post-war Munich free from its ties to the birth of Nazism. In a bid to show that the violent past had been done away with, there was an effort to minimize the presence of armed security. Although, that is not to say the organizers were not aware of any risks involved. As part of the planning for the Games, the Munich Olympics organizing committee hired police psychologist Georg Sieber to come up with possible security risks. Sieber proposed 26 possibilities, including attacks carried out by the Irish Republican Army or other terrorist groups. Notably, Sieber's Situation 21 would prove to be an uncanny prediction. He suggested that a dozen or so Palestinian gunmen could break into the Olympic village in the early hours, take a number of Israeli hostages and demand the release of political prisoners held by Israel. One such Palestinian group was named Black September. The group had taken the name Black September in homage to the Jordanian Civil War. Black September was a militant offshoot of Fatah, the Palestinian National Liberation Movement. Fatah's goal was to reform the state of Palestine and utilized attacks on Israeli infrastructure and civilians. Fatah was formed along secular and socialist ideologies and would go on to push for a two-state solution. But in the early 1970s, Fatah was expelled from Jordan in the 1970 Jordanian Civil War. Its military was defeated with many of its leading members killed. Black September acted as an international terror group. They assassinated Jordanian politicians in reprisals for their expulsion, notably Prime Minister Wasfi Al-Tal, and conducted letterbombing campaigns against Israeli diplomats. It is disputed as to just what level of control or influence the Fatah leadership had over Black September, with some believing that Black September was merely a cover for Fatah whilst others see it as a concentration of Fatah's more militant members. In the early morning of the 5th of September, eight members of Black September disguised in Olympic tracksuits scaled the fence to the Olympic village. The group carried multiple duffel bags, filled with pistols, Kalashnikov automatic rifles and grenades. Using a stolen key, the group entered the building and made their way to the apartments housing the Israeli Olympic team. Yosef Gutfreund, a wrestling referee, was the first to be awakened by scratching at the door of apartment 1, which housed the Israeli coaches and officials. When he approached the door, it began to open, where he was greeted with a group of armed masked men. Yosef shouted, alerting everyone else who was sound asleep, and he sought to stop the intruders from breaking in. Meanwhile, another weightlifting coach, Tuvia Sokolovsky, awoke and smashed a window and made their escape. When the terrorists made it inside, fighting soon erupted. Another wrestling coach, Moshe Weinberg, grabbed a small knife and attempted to stop the intruders, but he was ultimately shot point-blank in the cheek. Bleeding from his face and held at gunpoint, Weinberg was forced to point out other potential hostages. In a move to save lives, Weinberg lied and told the terrorists there was no one in apartment 2, which in fact 
housed the track athletes, and instead led them to apartment 3, where the Israeli weightlifting and wrestling athletes were staying. He believed it was possible that this group of athletes had a better chance in subduing the attackers. Unfortunately, the sleeping athletes were caught unaware, and captured as hostages and marched to apartment 1. Weinberg again launched an attack on his captors, allowing athlete Gad Sabari to make his escape. Weinberg was this time shot and killed. Once inside the apartment, a weightlifter named Yosef Romano saw an opportunity to attack the captors with a knife, but he too was shot and killed. Weinberg's body was rolled out of the apartment and left as a warning to the outside world whilst Romano's body was reportedly castrated and left as a warning to the other hostages. During this time, the eight occupants of apartment 2 managed to flee the building and alerted the authorities as to what was happening. Demands were soon made by the captors for the release of some 234 prisoners. The hostage negotiations began. The exact situation, as described by Georg Sieber, had occurred to the letter of his prediction. Now, it was a matter of resolving the situation. Israel had a policy, and much counter-terrorism experience, of not negotiating with terrorists, whilst the German authorities had little in that regard. The German authorities initially offered a blank check to the captors in exchange for the release of the hostages. Yet, this was not about money for them. Attempts were made by advisors to the Arab League to reach an end to the situation, yet this would produce no results. Some German police did attempt to scale the apartment buildings in a bid to rescue the hostages, but at this stage, the world's media had descended on the site and were live broadcasting attempts by the police to climb the building. This was easily seen by the Black September team. By 6pm, the captors demanded a flight to Cairo. A plan was hatched to attempt a rescue of the hostages as the group would be moved onto the requested plane. The plan was to ambush the terrorists with snipers in the airport buildings, and a team of officers posing as the cabin crew of the plane. The terrorists were to be separated into two groups, one in the plane, whilst the second group would be in a position away enough from the hostages. The captors and the hostages were then airlifted by helicopter to the first in Feldbrook airport. Initial reports and accounts from those who had gotten up close stated that there were no more than five captors, and so, only five sharpshooters were stationed at the airport. The eight undercover armed police officers in the plane had no way to communicate with anyone as they were lacking any radios. It was only after the arrival at the airport did the German police realize that there were in fact eight terrorists. On arrival, the captors took the helicopter pilots hostage, contrary to their early assurances they would not. The leader of the group, Lotif Afif, and another boarded the plane to inspect the situation. To their alarm, the plane was completely empty, no pilot or crew. Before the helicopters containing the hostages and captors even touched down, the team inside the plane decided to abandon the plan. Without notifying anyone of the situation and leaving the snipers completely outnumbered. Sensing a trap, the pair ran back to the others resulting in friendly fire between the captors in the confusion. As those captors moved a safe distance from the hostages, the police snipers opened fire. Their initial rounds went off target and a full gun battle ensued. But this situation allowed the helicopter pilots to make their escape as their two captors were killed. The Israeli captives, however, were still sitting bound in the helicopters, four in one and five in the other. The initial gun battle would go on for more than an hour, resulting in a German police officer named Anton Fliegerbauer being killed. In order to break the stalemate, the German police launched an attack in the hopes of moving the captors away from the helicopters. Armoured personnel carriers were called in as backup, though as they were not part of the initial plan, there were delays in their arrival. As the attack began and upon seeing the approaching armoured vehicles, the captors likely realised there was little more that could be done. In response, one of the captors fired his rifle into the captives, 
and then threw a grenade into the helicopter. The helicopter's fuel tank exploded, killing all five athletes within. This was shortly followed up with another captor entering the second helicopter. He shot and killed the last four hostages. The police were able to arrest three of the captors, with the other five killed during the firefight. The situation came to an end at around half one in the morning. After the failure of the operation, questions were raised as to why so many had died. The German police initially claimed the captors were simply too clever. West Germany had no experience in dealing with such situations and had under-equipped police officers without the necessary experience. For example, the sharpshooters at the airport were not equipped with infrared or telescopic scopes, nor were they equipped with rifles with sufficient accuracy for the range they were expected to shoot. There is also a debate as to whether Israeli Mossad agents may have offered their experience and as to whether German state authorities rejected their offer. The initial ambush plan did not change despite new information that there were more captors than originally thought. Manfred Schreiber, the Munich police chief in charge of the operation, was no stranger to hostage situations. A year prior, Schreiber was cleared of involuntary manslaughter for a botched rescue during a bank robbery, where a hostage was killed. It is debated as to whether this earlier failing affected his decision making or his competence as to the rescue plan. During the firefight, one of the sharpshooters was poorly positioned and not able to fire until late into the night. He and one of the helicopter pilots were also subject to friendly fire, which resulted in both of them being injured. As for the police officers within the plane, they made the decision to leave as they felt they were ultimately set up to die, and so they cast a vote to leave. Questions were also raised as to the response of the Olympic Committee. Upon hearing that the hostage situation had begun, Avery Brundage, committee president, insisted that the games must go on. It was not until nearly 4pm that the games were suspended. On the 6th of September, a memorial was held, yet, in his speech, Brundage made no reference to the murdered athletes and coaches. To make matters even worse, a cousin of Moshe Weinberg named Kamal Elias collapsed and died of a heart attack during the memorial service. Whilst many of the participating nation's flags were flown half-mast, ten Arab states refused and flew theirs at full mast. Following the memorial, the Israeli Olympic team left Munich and all other Jewish athletes were placed under guard. Many other athletes left the games, stating that the events had robbed them of their passion to compete. Following the botched handling, West Germany formed the GSG-9, its first counter-terrorism police department. Israel's response was to begin Operation Wrath of God. The goal was to track down and kill those responsible for the Munich massacre. According to General Aharon Yariv, the man overseeing the operation stated the following about the need for Wrath of God. We had no choice. We had to make them stop and there was no other way. We are not very proud about it, but it was a question of sheer necessity. We went back to the old biblical rule of eye for an eye. Whilst a number of Black September members were assassinated in July of 1973, a Mossad hit squad mistakenly killed Ahmed Bushiki in a Norwegian ski resort in Lillehammer. Bushiki was a Moroccan waiter and had nothing to do with a Munich attack. On the 29th of October, two months after the massacre, two Black September hijackers took control of a German Lufthansa plane travelling from Damascus to Frankfurt. They threatened to blow up the plane, the crew and the passengers if their demands for the release of the three surviving terrorists from the Munich massacre were not met. The exchange was made by the German authorities without consulting or even notifying Israel. It would come to light that the hijacked plane had been selected in advance by West German officials and the Fatah. The plane was empty when it left Damascus and only a handful of male passengers boarded at a scheduled stopover in Beirut. In exchange for the release of the prisoners, West Germany negotiated assurances from Fatah that no further actions would take place within West Germany. 
In the following years and months, a cover-up began as to the events surrounding the massacre. Georg Siber, the man who identified the risk, was fired from his role. Documents were suppressed and hidden for over 20 years. The German magazine Der Spiegel reported that German authorities were hiding around 4,000 documents. Notably, documents surrounding a warning sent of a Palestinian attack to take place at the Olympics. The warning came some three weeks before the Games, and yet no additional security measures were taken. The Munich massacre is a tragedy that ought to have been avoided. The goal of the Munich Olympics was to stress the peaceful nature of a post-Nazi Germany. Yet, such lax security presented an open target. Ignoring all security and intelligence advice, and instead favouring for a peaceful appearance, led to a violent hostage situation. The lack of experience in dealing with such a situation resulted in a massacre and an Olympic Games forever tainted. What's more, it was on German soil that Jewish athletes were killed, many of whom were relatives consumed by the Holocaust. What ought to have been a reconciliatory event left many dead. As for the Black September, they undoubtedly succeeded in their goals. The Palestinian cause was brought to the fore, and those involved were seen as heroes of the cause. I would invite you all to read a little further into the Olympic Games that signalled the shift in how countries would look to deal and prepare for terrorist threats and into the victims of the tragedy. A list of those who were murdered will be in the description. <laughs>